Childhood trauma is a hot topic right now. When it's on the cover of magazines, it's the topic of cutting edge research, and every kind of healing professional is finding a way to tie trauma-informed care into their services. This recognition and experimentation is all a step in the right direction, and it's raising awareness of the problem. But here's the thing. Research has shown almost no definitive pattern of effectiveness associated with any particular approach to treatment. And this is despite thousands of practitioners who claim that they treat the effects of childhood trauma. Some people are finding help and recovering though. So let's go through some of the most common treatments that people use. The most common treatments by far are medication or therapy or the combination of both. So let's start with medication. Depression and anxiety are completely common in people with complex trauma. And these days, it's highly likely that those who seek help for these problems will be prescribed antidepressants and or anti-anxiety medication. With complex trauma, medication can be somewhat helpful to calm intense symptoms, though in many cases, it can delay recovery by dulling awareness or producing a brain fog. And there can be serious side effects, including suicidal and homicidal ideation sexual difficulties, and a sense of numbness when trying to make decisions or connect with others, all very important to recovery. Medication can't offer a cure. The benefits will subside, as well as the side effects, as soon as the medication is discontinued. Traditional talk therapy, including cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, which attempts to replace negative associations with positive ones, is the standard of our times for anything trauma-related. Some related kinds of therapy that have been used for trauma include cognitive processing therapy, exposure therapy, and dialectical behavior therapy. And these focus on aspects of trauma such as memories, sensitivity to triggers, and the regulation of emotions. Now talk therapy has helped many people, but research has produced conflicting findings about the effectiveness in treating the effects of trauma from childhood. Therapy and medication are the default treatments for people who are suffering emotionally. And I've heard many people say they found them helpful. But with childhood PTSD, they're more likely to fail than to work. The assumption that we have a chemical imbalance or that we need to talk about the past can actually be paralyzing for us or worse, triggering. It is so common for adults who had a hard childhood to just kind of go round and round the merry-go-round of the old system therapy, medication, new therapist, new medication, and so on, and never really recover. And after a while, when hope fades, they blame themselves or they justify themselves. And what we now know is that childhood PTSD is, at its foundation, neurological. It develops in relation to brain changes caused by early adversity, abuse, neglect, and other intensely stressful conditions. So for example, the brain development in a baby who's neglected by parents can be slowed and altered instead of learning from a loving parent to connect and feeling comforted by loving touch. A neglected baby is overwhelmed by stress and all the body reactions that come with that. And this baby might develop a more or less permanent state of terror that she'll be left alone or she'll learn to escape the flood of emotion and just space out, seeming to need nothing. And these adaptations literally produce changes in brain development. And those changes leave us prone to dysregulation when we grow up. Now, most of the time, most people, including us, are well-regulated. Brain waves and body systems are working smoothly, evenly, like a series of lines just flowing along together. When a stress response is triggered, which happens a lot when you have childhood PTSD, brain waves and body systems, like heart rate variability, that's the way your heart rate and breathing kind of go up and down together, they get erratic, like squiggly lines just kind of going in all directions. So triggers might be a loud noise, a critical remark, a feeling of being left out or abandoned or something embarrassing. And most people might feel some distress at these triggers, but for us, they can launch an emotional explosion inside, like a, a flood of rage or a flood of shame or checking out mentally and emotionally called dissociation. Flooding is often followed by dissociation and all of it is connected to dysregulation. Are you relating to this so far? Yeah? When you're dysregulated, 
you lose your train of thought or you may lose your ability to find the right words or you might feel clumsy or panicked or lost or literally numb. In a dysregulated state, it's very easy to miss danger signals or to emotionally overreact or to make grave social mistakes. And it can be really hard to pay attention, remember, communicate or learn. Now, once you learn this, it can explain so much about why school has been a challenge, why relationships can be so troubled and why it is so hard to change. It can also help explain why medication and therapy have not worked so well for childhood PTSD. Now, I just need to say medication and therapy work really well for some people. And if you're a therapist or a doctor who does not tend to get dysregulated under stress, it must seem like these traditional approaches to treatment would be effective, but there's no clear evidence that they're a good line of treatment. In fact, for people who tend to dysregulate, talking about troubling memories, like in therapy, can make things worse and we get more upset and less able to think or analyze. And medication can interrupt whatever natural processes may be available to us to re-regulate our brains. They're not specifically designed for re-regulation and their effects don't match very well with our symptoms. So what treatments are better tailored to help with dysregulation? As you may have already noticed, I'm personally wary of a lot of professional opinions only because in the past, the help people tried to offer me was usually off base and unhelpful, if not outright harmful but different people respond to different things. And many, many medical and mental health professionals are actively engaged with new research and revising standard approaches to care. There is so much hope. So it is well worth summarizing some things that others have found helpful. I was convinced to be open-minded by Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score. He's a psychiatrist at Harvard who's dedicated his whole career to understanding trauma and what actually helps us. And here are a few things that he has recommended. One is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing or EMDR. It's a powerful technique. I've tried it. It's endorsed by the Veterans Administration and it helps to integrate the haunting traumatic memories typical of PTSD. Now in PTSD, the, active, the activation of, of certain memories produces an intense psychological and physiological distress like nightmares, pounding heart, an outburst of rage, as though the event is happening in the very moment. And these reactions occur again and again and again, and they don't tend to diminish over time. So EMDR involves the use of controlled side to side eye movements or vibrating paddles in two hands or other tools that alternately stimulate the left and right brain. And a practitioner helps you to visit traumatic memories and then reprocess them so they become more like a normal memory, remembered, but not so intensely charged. The effects of EMDR are long lasting. Occasionally, those who have benefited from it will opt to come back for EMDR sessions months or years later. But the technique is astonishingly effective at treating adult onset trauma. And I used it with great success to help me get over a trauma that happened 12 years ago when I found a friend dead. Yeah, long story, but EMDR is not as effective at treating complex trauma, which is the kind of um, thing we're dealing with with childhood PTSD. Neurofeedback is another promising treatment. The practitioner attaches electrodes to your face and scalp to measure brain activity and monitor when you're in a relaxed state versus a stress response. And you then listen to sounds or watch a video or some kind of stimulus that changes with your brain states. And when I tried it, I watched a travel video on a screen that would go dark whenever my brain was dysregulated or unfocused or stressed. And then it brightened when I calmed my mind. And you're barely conscious of what you're doing, but apparently our brains can learn from this form of biofeedback to reach a relaxed, alert state more of the time and stay there longer. And it can take dozens of sessions to get lasting results, which can be a drawback if you don't have rockstar health insurance or lots of cash, but a lot of people have found it helpful. Tapping is a technique uh, a lot of people swear by, and the technique involves actual tapping of your arms and your face and your head and your torso to calm anxiety and harsh emotions. And there are terrific videos on YouTube that show you how to do it, tapping with your fingertips along acupressure points or meridians of the body. And some say the benefits are just a placebo effect, but I say if it's free and it's easy and it works for you, it's awesome. Writing is a free and simple technique that I rely on heavily to re-regulate. 
Our self-expression through writing comes from a different part of the brain than speaking. So writing about what's bothering us can be a way around the upset we sometimes experience from talking about problems. Some studies suggest it's the physical action of writing too, using your hand and touching the paper that helps to get the thoughts out of your head and somewhere more manageable to process. Some people journal, some people free associate on paper. I teach everyone who works with me to write what I call a personal inventory of fears and resentments twice a day, followed by meditation. And I have a free video on that technique and you can share it with absolutely anyone. And it's also really nice to write inventory and meditate with other people, which brings me to meditation. Personally, I think everyone should meditate, especially people with emotional difficulties or attention problems. And I can't tell you how many people tell me that I can't meditate. And if this is you, I just say that's all the more reason to sit down and close your eyes for a few minutes or better yet, 20 minutes. You can take a class, which is really helpful, or you just watch the YouTube videos on how to do it. And I've learned several forms of meditation over the years. I've learned mindfulness, Vipassana, passage meditation. But the one I've stuck with regularly for the last 24 years is Vedic meditation, which is also known as transcendental meditation. I like it because it's super easy just using a mantra to focus on for 20 minutes twice a day. You don't have to sit a special way. You can do it on, the, on a train or in your car or even in bed, which works for me. And I'm a very busy person, so this makes it doable. Another category of treatments that help with dysregulation is physical methods. And this includes yoga, dance, martial arts, as well as touch, massage, body work, movement therapies, such as somatic body work, Reiki, Feldenkrais, and I know there are more. These help to heal the nervous system and integrate awareness of the self and the environment through movement. And it completely makes sense that traumatic memory is stored in the body and can be accessed, triggered, or soothed through physical means. And just one very good common sense thing to know, vigorous exercise, like hard enough to break a sweat, is one of the most effective treatments. Now back when I had the adult onset PTSD at the time I mentioned in this video when I found a friend dead, I was absolutely drowning in a massive repetitive fight or flight reaction for like 18 months. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. This was right before I learned that what I had was PTSD. And my doctor and therapist were pushing medication because for real, adrenal overload like this can break down your immune system and it opens the door to more serious illnesses. So any intervention might be better than nothing, but I did a little online research at the time that suggested I go running 45 minutes a day and stop eating sugar. And my symptoms were reduced, I would say by about 60% the first week. So I'd recommend you do that every day, trauma or no trauma, but definitely if you're recovering from childhood PTSD, I can also vouch for yoga. Some gifted professionals have developed yoga practices specifically designed for treating trauma, meaning there's sensitivity around the feelings and memories that could be triggered by certain poses and an emphasis on being conscious and gentle with whatever may be triggered. More treatments are being tried and tested all the time. So forgive me if I didn't cover some of what you know about that you found helpful. I try to keep learning what's out there and I will look forward to learning more. Personally, learning about dysregulation was the really big turning point for me. Once you understand dysregulation, you may find you need to kind of rethink a lot of beliefs you have, beliefs that you inherited from therapists or doctors and the culture in general, that the way your crappy childhood affected you is mainly psychological, which is now we know it's, it's, it's also, or maybe mostly neurologic, so, neuro, neurological. So here are some reasons that may have been applied to you as well as what might really have been going on. If you were depressed or anxious, you may have been told you have a chemical imbalance. If you made a self-sabotaging choice, you may have been told you were trying to recreate your childhood in order to work it out or conquer it. Or if you gained a lot of weight, you may have been told you were trying to avoid intimacy. If you smoke, they may have told you you have an unconscious need to rebel or maybe even a death wish. Now, there may be some truth to these assumptions, but it is much more likely that what was really going on is dysregulation was affecting your mood and dysregulation was complicating your perception of danger in stressful situations 
and dysregulation was maybe disrupting your hormonal systems that regulate appetite and metabolism and smoking hell smoking is a crude but effective way to re-regulate when you're dysregulated that's why it's so hard to quit take it from me because that is exactly why i used to be a two pack a day smoker and then i learned to re-regulate and was able to let that go my point is this assumption that all our problems are psychological is just not true and it may have left us with some confusion and self-blame that somehow you're the crazy girl and everything you experience is wrong but nope you're off the hook the root cause of our childhood ptsd is neither chemical nor psychological it's neurological and early trauma can cause actual structural changes in the developing brain and this means we're actually wired differently than other people